Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Canto 10, chapter 72, text number 5, chapter is entitled, The Slaying of the Demon Jarasandha. Ta deva deva bhavitas charanara vinda Seva nubhavam ihyapasyatu loka eshaha Ye tvam bhajanti nam bhajant yutla vaba ye sam. Nishtam prabarsaya vibo guru srinjayanam. Tam deva deva bhavitas charanara vindha. Seva nubhavam hi apasya tu loka esaha. Yadvam bhajanti yam bhajanti uta faubhayesam. Nishtam prabhasaya vibho kuru srinjayanam. Ta deva deva bhavitas charanara vindha Seva nubhava mihya pasya tu loka esaha Ye tvam bhajanti nam bhajanti yuta vobo yasam Nishtam pabarsaya vasa Vibho kuru srinjayanam
ladies. <coughs> Tut, therefore, Deva Deva, O Lord of Lords, Bhavata, your Charanada Vinda, to the lotus feet, Seva, of service, Anubhavam, the power, Iha, in this world, Pasyatu, May they see Loka, the populace, Aishaha, this, yea, who, Twam, you, Vajanti, worship, Nabajanti, do not worship, Yuktava, or else, Ubayesam, of both, Nishtam, the status, Padarsaya, please show, Vibo, O oh, all powerful one, Kuru Srinjayanam, of the Kurus and the Srinjayas. Translation Therefore, O oh Lord of Lord, let the people of this world see the power of devotional service rendered unto your lotus feet. Please show them, O mighty one, the position of those kurus and sanjayas who worship you, and the position of those who do not. So this is King Yudhisthira speaking, and he's speaking to Krishna in the assembly of great sages and saints. Please repeat, therefore, O Lord of Lords, let the people of this world See the power of devotional service render to your lotus feet. Please show them, O Almighty One, the position of the those Kurus and Sanjayas who worship you and the position of those who do not purport by the disciples of the A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Here we clearly see the heart of a preacher. The great devotee Yudhisthira Maharaj employs Lord Krishna to demonstrate plainly, plainly the results of worshipping him and the results of not worshipping him. If the people of the world could understand this, they could begin to recognize that Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and that everyone is ultimately, he, excuse me, if the people of the world could understand this, they could begin to recognize that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and that everyone's ultimate self-interest lies in surrendering unto him. As confirmed by great authorities, Yudhisthira Maharaj is a pure devotee of the Lord. And thus his actual motivation in discharging his duties as a king was to establish the supremacy of the Supreme Lord, Personality of Godhead. This is the real purport of the activities of the Pandavas, which are described in both the Srimad Bhagavatam and in the Mahabharat. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Naisi Gudave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Bande Ham Shiguro Shiuta Padekamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha Si Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganat Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam 
Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamsha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brindavaneswari Vishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Taru Vishya Sindhu Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gaudavani Pacharine, Nirvasesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine. Hmm. So, in this chapter, which is entitled The Slaying of the Demon Jarasandha. The beginning is describing how the great King Yunastir Maharaj is feeling great anxiety for the people of the world. He's, in the previous verse and in this verse, he's, he's, he's unhappy. You might say, well, why would he be unhappy? He's sitting in the association of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <laughs> and he's surrounded by his brothers, his well-wishers, and he's established on the throne. Everything is glorious from his position, but still he's feeling some sadness, some unhappiness. Why? Because the world doesn't recognize Krishna. <laughs> And even those who notice him don't understand his position. Therefore, he feels unhappy. The Lord is not being worshipped properly, and there's those who don't worship him at all. So this particular purport begins by explaining this is the heart of a preacher, or the heart of one who has compassion and also concern both for the Lord and for the conditioned souls. Mm -hmm. So here, Yudhisthira Maharaj is, he wants somehow or other for people to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And because he's, that's not happening, he feels unhappy. <laughs> so, in our Krishna Consciousness Movement, uh, there's two things. There's called Bhajan Anandi and Ghost Anandi. These are descriptions or titles of those who take up the process of pure devotional service. A Ghost an a Bhajan Anandi, a Bhajan Anandi is one who is satisfied by performing their own devotional service. What is that? Well, they very nicely and very seriously worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But they are considered, what we say, second class. Why? Because they don't have compassion for people in general. <laughs> Although they are fixed in their own worship, they fall short of actually pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead because the mood of the Supreme Lord and of course the great Acharyas who are representing the Lord is to give the mercy of the Lord to others. <laughs> so there's a class of persons who are called ghost Anandis, and they are concerned about their own spiritual life of course and very serious in their execution of their duties. But whatever they gain they want to give 
and they find that the happiness in their execution of the worship of the Lord. So this mood is called the mood of preaching or the mood of reaching out and giving the mercy of the Lord to others. And that's basically, not basically, essentially, <laughs> the mood of this Krishna consciousness movement. <laughs> um, it is a preaching movement. There are many persons, and you find, you go to many temples around India and in places of the world. They have very nice temples, and the worship goes on in various ways, different deities, different manifestations of the Supreme Lord. But they're not so eager to give this mercy to others. And therefore, there's a certain lacking in their own execution of their spiritual practice. Because uh, it, it actually says, and uh, it's interesting, we can just change directions here for a little bit, and we look at the Christian tradition for a, a bit, and there's Christ, um, of course, he was in a recipient, but there are ten commandments uh, in the Christian tradition. And the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. In other words, give everything to God. Your mind, your body, your words, your life. And the second commandment is, is, the, is the interesting one because it says to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. <laughs> to show that same concern that you have for yourself towards the others. Neighbor means everyone, really. That's the actual meaning of the word neighbor. It means other living entities. So what is that saying is that whatever you have that is valuable in your life, if you really want to understand the value of you, what you have, you have to share it with others. <laughs> so doing good to others means also doing good to yourself. <laughs> And vice versa, doing good to yourself means to do good to others. So the mood of preaching is the mood of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that mood filters down into his uh, devotees who want to give his mercy to others like that. So the devotees are always thinking how to somehow or other attract the conditioned souls to the lotus feet of the Lord. <laughs> Prabhupada said, and he said it many times, he says, for, our, for we, we have no problems. Devotees don't have any problems. We can sit down anywhere, we can chant Hare Krishna, we take prasadam, we can sit and discuss philosophical teachings from Shastra. And Krishna provides whatever we need. There's no problem. But we do have problems because our problem is how to give this to people who don't want it. <laughs> how to give somebody, something to somebody who doesn't really want it, but at the same time needs it. <laughs> so the idea is to convince them that they need it. And then when they start becoming convinced, they'll understand they really want it. <laughs> So therefore, the devotees of the Lord are always thinking how to give Krishna to others. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, and he said, by my command, be guru and save the land. <laughs> he told this to the Korma Brahma. The Korma Brahma wanted to, Lord Chaitanya was visiting Korma Shetra, and he stopped at the house of this very wonderful devoted Brahmin, Paka Brahman in all respects and very devotional. He stayed at the house of the Korma Brahma for a few days and after a while he left. The Korma Brahma was a grihasta, he had family. When the Lord was leaving, Korma Brahma became so unhappy that he simply wanted to go with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He said, I cannot live without your, your association. Please, I must come with you. 
I want to leave everything, my family, everything behind and just come with you. The Lord said, no. You go back, you take care of your family. And whoever you meet, you tell them about Krishna. And then he made that statement, by my command, be guru, save the land. Anyone you meet, simply teach them the process of chanting the holy names of the Lord. And then the Lord said, if you do that, you'll never be, you'll never feel the lack of my associate. You'll always be with me. I will always be with you. <laughs> so the Lord gave a very glorious exclamation or a declaration that by preaching or giving Krishna consciousness to others, we always have the association of the Lord. <laughs> Mm. The heart of the Lord is compassion, and one who takes up that process of giving the mercy of the Lord is actually understanding the heart of the Lord. <laughs> Become Krishna conscious and give it to others. And sometimes we might say, well, I don't know a lot of Shastra. You know, I'm not so expert at speaking to people. I'm kind of shy. I'm a little reserved. But one doesn't have to be a platform, as Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says. A preacher is not simply one who sits on a platform and speaks philosophy. <laughs> we might say that is one kind. But Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati makes a very interesting statement. He says the platform speaker may speak something and he may do good to somebody. But one who speaks one to one on individuals can do more for people in general than they can than the platform speaker. Isn't that interesting? This is Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. One who takes time on an individual basis to give Krishna consciousness to individuals like that is more effective and has more what we say uh, yeah, more effectiveness than those who simply give a lecture in a general assembly like that. That's Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. It's not that we, do, we don't do the general lectures. That's important. And that's our process. But it, it just shows that anybody at any time can simply speak Krishna consciousness to anyone and, and do good to that individual. So it's not a matter of position, it's not a matter of ashram, it's not a matter of economic, what we say, situation. It's simply a matter of desire. So. And one who does that it's, it becomes very dear to the Lord. Prabhupada would sometimes say, if one of my devotees becomes a pure devotee, then he can take me back to Godhead. Now, why would Prabhupada say that? Srila Prabhupada is not only a pure devotee, he is, he is a Mahabhagavat. He's one who is completely free from all material tendencies and fixed completely on the lotus feet of the Lord 24 hours a day. But what he's saying is that one who actually becomes Krishna conscious and preaches Krishna conscious they can take anybody back to Godhead, <laughs> even their spiritual master. <laughs> so Prabhupada's statement was a statement of humility, but at the same time he was actually explaining the power of one who becomes fully Krishna conscious. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, I'm sorry, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, in one of his beautiful songs writes, what is the process of Krishna consciousness? He sums it up in three, three uh, aspects. He says, Nam ruchi. Ruchi means taste. Not only taste, but a sweet taste. That which attracts. For chanting the holy names of the Lord. Vaishnav seva. Serving the devotees of the Lord. And jivadoya. <laughs> jivadoya is... Jiva means the living entities. Doya means mercy or compassion. Giving the mercy of the condition to the conditioned souls. 
So these three things are the heart of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. So now we are, what we say, in a particular time of the year when there is what is called the book distribution marathon. In fact, I was asked to speak about the book distribution marathon in this class. Not asked, I was told to. <laughs> And I would prefer to be told to <laughs> than asked to. <laughs> and so this particular time of the year is the time where people celebrate holidays. And holidays means gifts. And people are out shopping more. Of course, India is now becoming like the Western societies. And so they're trying to pattern their lives around doing what the Westerners do spend all day shopping. <laughs> yeah. Not to divert too much attention from the subject matter, but in Western countries, here I think they said that the number one religion in, in India is cricket. And that's what I was told anyway. And the number one religion in America is shopping. <laughs> Everywhere there are shops and more shops. In fact, they even have signs say, shop till you drop. And people like to shop, only shop. In fact, they, it becomes so bad that actually there's so much of a, a fetish, a, when we say an urge to shop, that actually people actually become neurotic through shopping. You've heard of Alcoholics Anonymous, where people who become intoxicated and need some extreme help go to these different agencies and get the help they need in order to cure their intoxication habits. They have Ox Alcoholics Anonymous, they have Narcotics Anonymous, and they have what is called Shopaholics. Yeah, it's an agency where people who shop too much become neurotic and not only become neurotic, but at the same time, they also deplete their economic sources and become bankrupt and wind up in great debt. <laughs> yeah. And there's articles and the you know, different uh, talks about you know, shopping till you can't do anything else. <laughs> so this is a time of the year of course, India is not that bad, but at least it's trying to catch up to the West <laughs> in, these, in these areas. And uh, so we're out there with our books. And so we try to encourage them. Here is the perfect gift for the holidays, you know, Christmas, New Year's, whatever, like that. And people are more eager to buy things this time of the year, so it's more eager, it's more, what we say, more uh, advantageous to distribute books this time. But if one receives a book, even if they buy it as a gift for someone else, even if they don't read it themselves, Prabhupada wrote a, a most amazing letter in 1977 the date is May 6, 1977. He wrote it to the German Yatra, the book distributors in Germany. And he talks about the glories of book distribution. He commends the devotees for their, for their sacrifice in going out and bringing the mercy to the conditioned souls. And then in one part of the letter, he says something extraordinary. He says, if anyone gets a book, their life becomes perfect. If they read it, their life becomes perfect. If they touch the book, their life becomes perfect. And if they simply see the book, <laughs> their life becomes perfect. He writes like that. Because these books are not simply, what we say, pages with paper and what we say, uh, ink and various types of pictures, they're actually manifestations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in literary form. Mm -hmm. Srimad Bhagavatam, 
Bhagavad Gita are incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in literary form. And so when one actually accepts the book, they're actually accepting the Lord into their life, into their, into their heart, if they really accept it. So the gopis glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead in one verse, Tavakatam Vritam Tapsa Jivanam. In the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 10th canto, I believe it's 32nd chapter, in one of the verses. Those who actually worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead by spreading the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they are the best of all devotees of the Lord. A devotee never considers themselves better than another devotee, but the Lord sees that one who is distributing my mercy, Prabhupada said, they get special attention. <laughs> As uh, Prabhupada would use the example that those who are in a battle, in the battle you have the army, and then you have different aspects or divisions within the army. You have your cooks, you have your, you know, mechanics, you have your different aspects of keeping the army going. But those who are on the front lines, they're doing the actual fighting, they actually get what we say the most attention and most care because they're right in the heart of the battle. Prabhupada uses that example to show that those who are out there distributing his books will get the, mo the most attention from the Supreme Personality of Godhead because they're doing the work of the Lord, giving Krishna consciousness to other in the form of these books. <laughs> and there's so many amazing, what we say, episodes in the life of our ISKCON movement and how these books have actually revolutionized people's lives. <laughs> uh, there's so many stories. There's one story, it's quite a, should I tell you this story? It's, uh, I don't know, maybe you've heard it before. It's an interesting story. It happened in uh, Holland where one book distributor, he was out distributing books and he had about six or seven different copies of different titles. <coughs> and, uh, no, and also, I'm sorry, he had the Bhagavad Gita with him. That's right, he had the Bhagavad, only the Bhagavad Gita. So he was in an area that was a high security area, some place where People are more like private residences. And so he decided to go in there and distribute the books. <laughs> so somehow he got in. But when he was in, the security noticed him. So the security started to come towards him to see who this person was. And the devotee, I don't know if he did the right thing, but apparently at the end of the story, he did. He started to run. <laughs> And the security started to chase after him. So there was a chase. <laughs> so the devotee is running and the security guard is chasing him. So he's running and running. He comes to this alleyway. And he runs down the alleyway and it's a dead end. There's nowhere to go. He looks around and he sees a door. And he tries the door and it's open. He goes inside and he's in a dark hallway. He doesn't know where he is. <laughs> He walks down the hallway and he's walking down and he starts to see a light at the end of the hallway. So he goes towards the light and then he stops and he notices he coming, he's coming upon this group, this actually a program is going on in this hall. He, came, he comes from the back side of the hall and a, a person is on stage and he's speaking. So he stops and he's listening and the person says, Oh, and he turns around and he notices the book distribution. He said, oh, you've come. We've been waiting for you. Did you bring the gifts? 
and the devotee doesn't he starts taking the cue. Okay, yes, I brought the gifts. So he comes and he has all the the Bhagavad Gita's with him, and he says, "Yes, here's the gifts." And so he and he said, "Oh, he has arrived." And then he takes the gifts, gives it to the person, and he starts giving it out to individuals. And then the person says, how much is that? And so he just gives a figure, a couple hundred dollars or something. And the man writes him out of a check, thank you very much. And the book distributor says, um, can you let me know what kind of program this is? You know, I was, he said, yes, this is the National uh, Butcher's Convention. <laughs> and, uh, we were giving awards to some of the top butchers, so thank you for bringing the gifts. <laughs> so he distributed all his Gitas to the butchers, <laughs> who were apparently quite happy to receive the gift. <laughs> I'm not sure if they understood it when they read it, but <laughs> they simply got the mercy in an indirect way, or more or less direct way. So these are some of how Krishna, somehow or other arranges for those who are out on book distribution to do amazing things to reach the conditioned souls even by what we say by chance there's one other story which is one of my favorite stories it happened in America where one man he was feeling quite depressed and he, uh, he decided to take his own life so he drove his car which is a van into a parking lot. He sat into the parking lot and he took his exhaust pipe and he put the exhaust fumes back into the cab of the van and ran the engine with the windows closed. In other words, he was com committing suicide. So he's sitting in this public parking lot doing this. And it just happened to be two book distributors distributing books in the parking lot. <laughs> So they see him sitting in this van and they decide to go up and they knock on the window. And he has his engine running and he's got the windows up and he just waves them away. No. So the book distributor turns around and is about to leave but he decides to leave the book on the window of the car. So he leaves the book there and goes. So he's gone and the person who's committing suicide, he gets a little curious. He rolls down the window, picks up the book from this windshield, and starts to read it. And it says, here is the formula for becoming happy. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he wasn't so happy at the time, <laughs> committing suicide. And then there's a whole chapter, it was one of these smaller books, on how to find real happiness. So he decides to stop his program and starts reading the book. And he's, he reads the whole chapter about happiness, becomes inspired by what he reads. He becomes happy a little bit, and he decides to, to find out more. And in the back of the book, there's a, a listing of all the temples. He goes, he goes to the temple, and he goes to the temple and he explains everything, and he actually joins the temple and becomes a devotee. <laughs> Uh, book distribution saves lives, <laughs> literally, <laughs> spiritual life and, and one's material life also, we might say. So we can't really glorify the importance of those persons who take part in book distribution or who reach out to others with Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada made it a point in his movement. He said the Communist Party has become quite influential in distributing their propaganda because they went out on the streets and distributed person to person. He said and this is the same way we should distribute our books. So when, this, when devotees go out on the street, we meet people. There's one story, I think it happened here in it was during the Christmas Marathon and many years ago. I remember I heard this story told by the devotees here. And the devotees were, dis I think it was in the uh, Shivaji train station. They had, the devotees had a book stall in that area. And there was so many book distributors there. 
and they were positioned in different places, all distributing the Gita. So one man was walking along and one the book distributor came up and offered him the Gita. He said, no thank you, kept walking. So he's walking a little bit more and then a second book distributor comes up and then he says, no, no, I'm not interested. I already said no. He goes on and then a third one comes and he said, ah, oh, I can't resist. <laughs> so <laughs> he finally decided to take the book and read it and bought a book. You know, it's one, two, three, right after another. So, so somehow or other, uh, Krishna is in the heart of the devotees and the devotees are inspired to follow that inspiration by giving out the books apparently even to those who don't want them but actually do want them <laughs> Prabhupada said everyone is looking for happiness everyone is looking for Krishna <laughs> whether they know it or not Krishna represents that happiness everyone is looking for because Krishna is the source of everything and he is the reservoir of all pleasures. Therefore, his name is Rama, one who gives unlimited and, what we say, real pleasure. Mm -hmm. So everyone is looking. So we, as devotees, we remind everybody what they're looking for. <laughs> You're actually looking for God. You're actually looking for Krishna. And here's the knowledge by which you can understand your relationship with God in the form of these transcendental literature spoken by the Lord himself or spoken about the Lord by the Lord's pure devotees. So this book book distribution marathon and of course we don't just say the marathon but the mood of preaching is the way to bring Krishna consciousness. A devotee is not happy simply by their own Krishna consciousness. They want to give Krishna consciousness to others like that. And because they know that is the mood of the Lord. And that is the mood of the Lord's pure representatives who inspire everyone to preach Krishna consciousness. It's amazing. You know, like sometimes in Western countries, some of our devotees are little, little, shy or a little reserved to go to walk around in devotional attire and but I find that that's very helpful although there are people who are inimical and may also become negative when they see you but there's others who when they see you they start to question <laughs> like when I go through train stations and uh, I'm sorry airports terminals or just traveling in general, sometimes people say, are you a Buddhist? <laughs> I say, no, but I, we, are, we are somewhat of a Hindu. We practice Krishna consciousness, and then they are a little more curious. I usually carry mantra cards with me, or some small books. And sometimes they receive a book, give them a card, and even give them a address to one of our local temples. And so when devotees are out wearing Krishna conscious attire, in India, of course, it's natural, it's easy, but in the West, the devotees are a little shy sometimes for different reasons, because the Western atmosphere is quite sense, enjoyment, mood. But there are people who are seeking spiritual life. <coughs> I remember one day, just recently, this was happened interest, an interesting experience I had. I was in Detroit, Michigan, and we were preaching. And the next day we were supposed to leave to fly to Hartford, Connecticut. And it was two flights. And see, we were doing late night programs. So I asked my assistant, what time's the flight in the morning? He said, the flight's at 9-11. I said, that doesn't sound like a good flight time. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. So I asked him again the next day. He said, yeah, the flight's at a 9-11. So I didn't question it too much because I was tired and I think to have a later flight would be better. <laughs> it was kind of unconsciously, I'm happy that wasn't such an early flight. So we got to the airport thinking that we were gonna board the 9-11 flight 
And the lady said, oh, the flight left at 7.30. 9.11 was your arrival time. <laughs> so there we were, stuck. <laughs> and I had a program that afternoon in Hartford, Connecticut and to do the Sunday feast program. It was a Sunday. So they, she said, well, there's three of you. And I have um, a standby flight, on a, a standby seat on one of the next flights. So one of you can fly and the other two can fly standby. So uh, I got on. So they're all, we're all waiting in the terminal to see if anybody's canceling their flight so the other two devotees who are with me can get on. So while we're there, some people come up to us and say, who are you? Oh, we're Hare Krishnas. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Can you tell us a little about? So we gave out some mantra cards. And then there was an Indian family traveling there also. And they said, you know, Namaste, Hare Krishna. So we gave them a book. And then someone else saw one of our devotees with me. And he, she started asking, who are you? And we wound up preaching the whole time we were sitting in the terminal. <laughs> we missed our flight. But we had the, the best time distributing Prabhupada's mercy, giving our mantra cards and to at least three or four different people in that same place, just waiting for the flight that we weren't supposed to be on. <laughs> but, <laughs> but somehow we were stuck because we missed that flight. And we missed our early flight. So it was interesting how Krishna arranged that. He arranged for me not to know the actual time of the flight. Although I inquired many times, we missed the flight. But was it, a, was it good or not? It seems like it was because it gave us a chance to preach to so many different people. And then when the time came, there was enough seats and the three of us got on the flight and we made it in time for the Sunday feast. <laughs> of course, we missed lunch, but that didn't matter so much. <laughs> so, uh, this is... So because we, had a, because we were in the mood of preaching, Krishna continued that and, and gave us a chance to reach some people who may, may not have the, had the opportunity to receive Krishna's mercy like that. So this is Krishna conscious. That if we simply practice the mood of our own devotional service in the mood of when can I give Krishna consciousness to others? Pray for the opportunity to give that mercy to others. So this book distribution marathon is an acceleration of, of going out and trying to meet the conditioned souls. And Prabhupada said, flood the world with books. <laughs> Everywhere people turn, they simply see one of our books. <laughs> They can't get away from it. And that way, Krishna consciousness will spread more and more. Because these books are magical. If they simply read one page or even one word, Prabhupada says their life is beneficial. Like that. Because these, these books teach pure devotional service to the Supreme Person. And as Yudhisthira Maharaj is saying here, he becomes happy when others recognize the Lord and worship the Lord. Although he's, he's happy in his own worship and completely satisfied, still he's feeling unhappy because of the unhappiness of others. So this is the nature of a great soul. Okay, any questions or comments? No. Preaching. Okay. Hare Krishna. There's one question here. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. As you mentioned, India is becoming more and more westernized over a period of time. And uh, people think that. Uh, the way we live, the way uh, uh, the thinking we have to distribute this Krishna consciousness to others. In fact, we live in a society which is becoming more and more Western, and 
I have seen people, they dislike us, the way we live. They think these people, you know, Co they are fashion. somehow, you know, away from the uh, reality. They are somehow, you know, people, those who are, you know, uh, traditional type of people and they do not know actually what is the aim of life. They feel like that. Hmm. So many times uh, we feel that are, somehow we should try to tell them what is this Krishna consciousness. We have that desire, but somehow we are reluctant whether they will take it. And it's a fact, they don't want to take it. Hmm. Because they themselves, they feel that these people are you know, on wrong track and we are at right track. So in such situation, how to convince them, how to give hmm. them Krishna consciousness. Well, generally, you can't convince a person who doesn't want to be convinced. <laughs> but circumstances might find themselves in a situation where turning to God is the only solution to their problems that they experience. <laughs> So a lot of times we, you know, if somehow they can receive a book, even if they don't read it. <coughs> there was one story where one man, he received this one book, Bhagavad Gita, I think it was, yeah, it was Bhagavad Gita. And he just took it home, put it on his library shelf, and forgot about it. And then many, many, many years later, he was in a very emotional and I think it was even a physical crisis in his life. And he was turning to God for help, and he was looking for the Bible. So he went onto his bookshelf trying to find the Bible, but he, he just came across the Gita instead. <laughs> And he picked up and then he read that and it seemed to answer all the questions that he was struggling with. So a lot of times in the immediate situation people don't want it. But somehow or other through some contact or something that we can somehow connect with people that let them know that there's a temple here. <laughs> and that if you ever get a chance, come to the temple and see the Lord, get some prasad, like that. remind them. I don't know. There's different ways. People are different. But what the value of the Indian culture is the spirituality. Hmm. The essence of Indian culture is its spirituality. The success of Indian culture is its spirituality. So now people are turning away from that. You can remind them that the greatness of India is really is the, the saints and sages that have been here for thousands of years. This is the real, what we say, essence and because of that, this is what we say, Punyabhumi. <laughs> now you're trying to make it Papa Bhumi. <laughs> because Western, you know, Western society doesn't, uh, their values are in material gain. That's all. Material comforts. We don't reject material comforts but not at the expense of spirituality. Prabhupada's movement is to combine Western opulence with, spir with Indian spirituality, or what we say, uh, uh, Vedic spirituality. Mm -hmm. Combine both. It's not that we have to be poor, and you can also have material things, and, but worship the Lord and acknowledge that the Lord is the source and the owner of whatever you have. <laughs> so, our Krishna Consciousness Movement doesn't push out 
material, but at the same time we don't make it a priority. Mm -hmm. Our priority is our devotion to the Lord. Mm -hmm. They they think, well, you can only have one or the other. Remind them you can have both. All right, you want to follow the Western ways, but don't forget about your heritage like that. Don't try to turn them away from their, sp their Western ideas, but try to in inject the spirituality along with it. And that's how you more or less can reach people without turning them off and like that. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki. Srila Prabhupada's Book Marathon Ki. Gaur Pramanandai.